Good. All right, so now a lot of you have seen me, but we never formally met. My name is my name is Marcel, and I work for an organization that partners with Youth of Christ, and that's my baby. So I just, I, I just talk over a little bit. And that partners with Youth of Christ to offer a, a music studio to to the kids in this community. So what we do is we bring in engineers and producers from all over the city. They come in and they interact with our kids. And we try to we try to teach our kids how to engineer, how to produce. But more importantly, we try to mentor them. We try to just be a positive influence in your life because we're positive people that are investing into their lives. And so we're, we are open to anybody. We, we, we tend to say like 18 and under, but we have 24 year olds and 23 year olds. And we, are, we, just, we just love everybody. And so and we use the music studio as our vehicle to meet people and to love people. That's what we do. So anybody's welcome. And so if you ever want anybody to, if you know anybody who loves music and wants to do music, just have them talk to me or they can talk to Casey and we'll see if we can get them in there. All right? Cool. All right. So as, as Phil said, I'm going to talk a little bit about idol worship. Right. And we're going to talk about one specific idol, but not so much that idol. I don't, we're not going to talk about what it is or what he's like. We're going to talk about how the idol operates. We're going to talk about the idol Baal. So the Baal is one of the most popular idols in the Old Testament. He is associated with the sky. So he's thunder, rain, uh, lightning. So it's, here's a picture of Baal. He's always depicted. This is Baal. The most, he's probably the most popular idol in the Old Testament. Yeah? Oh, also known as Ra. Ra in Egypt. Yeah. There you go. That's Baal. So Baal. Baal is typically depicted like this. So he either has a, a knife in his hand or like or a lightning blade. And he actually, and so we, we don't hear too, too much about Baal in, in, in Western society, but have you, has anybody ever heard of Zeus? Anyone ever heard of Zeus? Mm -hmm. Baal and Zeus are the same people. So Baal goes from the Canaanite system, Israel, Israelite system, and becomes Belal Zeus, and eventually becomes Zeus in the Greek. So where is Baal at in the Bible? So the most, I would say, arguably the most popular story of Baal in the Bible is the story of Elijah. Has anyone heard the story of Elijah? And so... What's happening during the time of Elijah is the people of Israel have wandered away from God and they've begun to serve Baal. So God sees what's happening and he raises the prophet Elijah up and the prophet Elijah has a miraculous and wonderful ministry where he calls fire down from heaven. He confronts the prophets of Baal. He defeats them and he leads the people of Israel back to Yahweh. Yeah. So there you go. So that's Baal. And that's what he looks like. He's kind of like a Zeus just kind of guy. And if you want to find him, he is in 1 Kings uh, 17, 1 through 2 Kings 2 11. So that's where he is. But I don't want to get too much into that stuff. I want to get into how Baal operates. And so I want to do that by playing a game. Alright? A game. A mystery game is, is at that. Alright, so what we're going to do today is we're, we're going to examine Baal through the book of Ecclesiastes. Has anyone heard of the book of Ecclesiastes? Are you ready? Okay. So in the book of Ecclesiastes, basically what it's about is, is, a, is a man is giving a sermon, he's preaching. And he's really mad, he's really frustrated, and, he re and he's really agitated. And so you have to ask yourself, why? Well, he's, he's agitated because he's lost something, because something is absent in his life. Essentially, something has been taken from his life. Something has been robbed from him and from his community. And so what we want to do today is we want to verify my suspicion that Baal is actually the one that robbed this man and robbed his community. Okay? So, that's what do. so you guys are going to be like my detectives, I'm like the lieutenant, and you guys need to help me figure out who Ball was working with, what he stole, and how he did it. Okay? Is that cool? All right, so the first thing I want to do is I want you guys to work in groups, and I want you guys to get in three groups. So it could be either groups of two or three, and I'm going to give you guys a passage that I want you, kind of, that you, I want you guys to kind of process for a little bit, okay? All right. So, let me see. One, Janelle and him, and you two? Okay. That'll work? All right. Sounds good. So if you, if you have your Bible, if not, I'll, I'll come and bring it. The first one is all the same. So the first one is... Ecclesiastes 2, verses 4, 1 through 9. Right. And so your job here is this passage is describing somebody, someone, something. And I want you guys to put a name to it, like a person, place, a thing. Like, what is this passage describing? To me, it actually, it actually describes Michael Jordan. But to you guys, it might describe anybody else. So take a look at the passage. Figure out who do you think this passage resembles or who, who is the passage describing. Can you say it again? Uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. Are you going to 
You get it? No, it I, I got a phone if you want to read it. What's that? Yeah. Is it, oh, we all have the same passage? It's the same, the first one the same passage, yeah. Can you read it out loud? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I read it? I don't have to read it. All right, cool. All right, so here's the passage. Just, we, we'll just do it together. You guys can shout out names of who you are, people or places that you think this that this reminds you of. I apologize. What was it? was Ecclesiastics 4. Uh, chapter 2, 4 through 9. I'll read it right now. All right, so Ecclesiastes chapter 2, 4 through 9. So I started large projects. I built houses for myself. I planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks. I planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made lakes into water groves and healthy trees. I bought male and female slaves. <coughs> And I had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds than any, and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem ever before me. I stored up silver and gold for myself. I gathered up treasures and kings of, of the kings and their kingdoms. I got male and female singers. I also got many women for myself, women to light the hearts of men. I became far more important than anyone in Jerusalem had ever been before. And in spite of everything, I didn't even lose my wisdom. So as we hear that, what, what, kind of, what kind of characteristics come to mind? So this is the person who actually helped Baal do this robbery. So Baal never works alone. So this, this is the kind of person that Baal works with. So what kind of person does this sound like? Do they sound, kind of, they sound, do they sound very humble? <laughs> Materialistic. Materialistic. <laughs> hey, what, else, what else do you guys hear? He's rich. Rich, very wealthy, okay. Well, the powerful kind of, you got slaves and stuff like that? Self slaves, built, built reservoirs. Built reservoirs, yeah. Yeah, so he, if he built them, that he mean they had a lot of money. Yeah. And so we talked about the gold and that silver. Definitely. So we have an arrogant, rich, materialistic slave driver. Can you guys think of a person, place, or thing that, that fits that profile? I know last night when I talked to my wife about this, she said America. So she said American fences <laughs> profile. You, can you guys think of anybody that fits this profile? I think Michael Jordan fits it. He kind of this, this arrogant, I've accomplished everything. I, I walk on the, I walk on the, my own. What's the rapper? Jesus walks. Kanye West? Okay, Kanye West. So arrogant. Okay. Kanye West. I like Kanye West. Right. So, so we got American. I think Michael Jordan. So we have Kanye West. Well, anybody else? Anybody you can think of as arrogant, super rich, very materialistic? Um, a lot of politicians. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Politicians. That's not it. A group, a group of people. It could, be, it could be a group of people. Politicians. All right. <laughs> Definitely. All right. So there. Group politics. So now we have politicians. America. Kanye West. And I said. And I said Michael Jordan. So what did you say? That works for me. Or Paris Hilton. <laughs> Paris Hilton. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so a lot of people fit this category. Could have been working with Ball. All right, cool. Now, in the second stage, we need to figure out what Ball, how, what did Ball steal through Kim Kardashian, through Kanye West, through America, through these politicians? What did, what did he take from this preacher who was, who was preaching? What did he take from this, from this community? Mm -hmm. And so we can actually do it together. So the first passage comes in Ecclesiastes, if you want to follow, is in Ecclesiastes 2, 20 and 21. And it reads like this. So we're trying to figure out what did he take from this, from this community. So we have to dig a little bit deep. So this is how this, is how this verse goes. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. So I began to lose hope because of all of my hard work on the earth, on this earth. A man might use wisdom, knowledge, and skill to do his work, but when he has to leave everything he owns to someone who hasn't worked for it, that doesn't have any meaning either. In fact, it isn't fair. So I'm going to read it again. He says, So I began to lose all hope because of all my hard work on this earth. A man might use wisdom, knowledge, and skill to do his work, but then he has to leave, it, leave everything he owns to someone else who hasn't even worked for it. That doesn't have any meaning either. In fact, it isn't fair. So what do you guys hear? What do you guys hear is absent in this? So contentment. Contentment. Hope. Hope. Yeah, that hope is definitely hope. Hope is there. Contentment. Okay, I would, I would take contentment. Contentment. What else? Joy. Joy. And there's no joy there. There's yeah, no peace. No peace. No love. No love. Pleasure. No pleasure. No trust. No trust. Just appreciation. No appreciation. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, at least I can't take it with me. Sounds really frustrated. You know, I worked for all of it, and then somebody else is going to get it, and they didn't do any of the work to have it. Mm -hmm. I did the work, so maybe a little selfishness. Selfishness, okay. Mm -hmm. Did he lost selfishness? No, he lost. I guess the opposite of selfishness. Was that Greater generosity? He lost <laughs> generosity. Okay, he lost yeah. unselfishness. Okay, cool. There we go. Okay. Cool. Anything else? So he lost being able to give or caring. He doesn't have a caring spirit. Except for himself. Okay. And what he has. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's like whoever has the most toys, and you know, now it looks like I'm getting ready to die. I'm getting ready to lose my life. You know. You feel like you want You know, I have no control over who's going to get it. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Exactly. Prosperity. Yeah. Very definitely. And so, like, even like, so even with that, so say, so say we work, we work really hard, we raise a lot of money, and we have a family. When we die, we're probably going to get our stuff. Our family. Our family. Oh, yeah, probably our kids, right? Yeah. yeah. It's something like he lost his legacy. That lost his legacy. He's not even happy to leave your stuff to your, your children. He you probably lost that on some relationships and stuff. Yeah, definitely. So as, I, as I hear you guys, so as I, as I put together what you guys are saying, would you guys agree that he kind of lost a sense of purpose? Like, he was work, maybe he was working for the wrong things. Like, so you, are you not working for your kids? That's what I work, you know? That's, so, so maybe he lost his sense of purpose. Maybe he, maybe he invested himself in the wrong thing. And at the end of his life, or his frustration is the root of him realizing that he's been dedicating himself to something that's purposeless. So maybe, maybe Baal came in and robbed him of a sense of purpose. He said, so now, as a people of God, I mean, what do, as we work, how do we draw our purpose from our work? So Phil said I work in the, so Phil said I work in the studio. A large part of my vision for the studio is I come from the background a lot of these kids come from. And so my hope is one day, ten years from now, they're looking around and they see all these little knuckleheads, like I see all these little knuckleheads, and they say, you know what? Ten years ago, when we were little knuckleheads, there was this guy named Marcel who who, who, did, who built the studio. And said, so we can come to the studio. He loved on us, he, he played with us, he talked to us, he, he ministered to us, he was he was there for us. Maybe I should do that. And so they become my sense of purpose, my legacy. They, that, that's and my purpose become, go, extends to them. So and that's, how, and that's how I understand God. God's going to continue to work through me, through me, and then into them, and then one day through them and into someone else. So that's, that's how I understand purpose in God. Does anybody else understand purpose in God in a, a certain way? As, as we work, as we put our, our hands and our hearts and our minds to, to do things for God? How, how do you guys find purpose in that? I would say just the sense of fulfillment. Okay. Um, I'm a lot more fulfilled in my day to day not having a job than I ever was slaving to attain whatever my goal of for wealth and and, and power. Okay. You know, it was, I, I thought I was enjoying myself then, but I'm a lot less stressed. I'm happier. I have life is a lot more adventurous. Mm. So I, I enjoy life a lot more than I ever did when I was when I thought I was enjoying. It. Mm. So, so, so if I hear Janelle, I, I hear her saying that a life not investing into purposeless things frees up space for us to kind of find purpose, right? So we can kind of search what we can look for, we can kind of explore, right? So that's a great. All right. So at the end of the day. The first thing that Bob has stolen is a sense of, I think, a sense of purpose from this community and from this man because he, I don't know why, I don't know how he did it. He stole it. He's gone. Now let's take, a, let's take out another passage of something else that was stolen. What you just said, you said he, he stole it. I don't know how he stole it. I, I would think because of his direction, he misdirected him as to what was important for life. Probably did. We haven't got that for you. Oh this, my this God. is fried ending, man. It's one of those things, man. We're <laughs> 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 still in the mystery, man. Oh, okay, my bad. So. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So the second, all right. So the second, the second element missing comes in Ecclesiastes th chapter three, verses eighteen and nineteen. So I'll read it. So this is the second thing. So, so the first thing he stole was that ball stole was purpose. The second thing he stole was this. I also thought, God puts human beings to the test. They can see that they are just like animals. What happens to animals happens to people too. 
That's waste for people and animals alike. People die just as animals do. All of them have their same breath. People don't have any advantage over animals. Nothing has meaning. Mm -hmm. So what do you hear? Yeah, it is sad. Yeah, it is sad. Yeah. 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 Hope or happiness. Yeah. yeah. So, so what do you guys hear lost in that? You can say that. You can, you can, you can, you can spoil it, man. He He lost his. I know who's talking. So he lost his relationship with with God above because. If he had that relationship, he continued and with that walk in that relationship, he would know that he is more than animal, right. than animal. Right. Like, I, I, think, I think you missed the point. I think you missed the point. It's, it's not so much that he's talking about that he's more than animal. The point is, is that he's got to die. <laughs> That's the point. He's talking about, man, death is coming. And I have no control of the fact that I have to die just like the animals do. God is testing me, and then I gotta die. And now, what? What? what, what, what why am I here? Why did I even come to Earth? Why was I born? I worked to accomplish all of this stuff, and now I'm getting ready to die. And whose stuff is it going to be? Yeah. And he's kind of ticked. He is mad. He's furious. Yeah. He's furious. Yeah. So what? So what's? So in that, what's, what's lost? So I mean, as a as a believer. As a, as, a, as a man who knows the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, what's what's lost in that? What's he missing? What matters? He's missing what matters. He's missing what matters. What else? What else is missing? Oh, you want somebody else to answer? I want you to answer. I want you to answer. I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. All right. Yeah. His his purpose. Yeah. His identity. Not purpose identity. So, I think also just his trust in God that there is a point to all of this. Like he's his perception of who God is is really skewed now. Mm -hmm. That this is all pointless and we're just gonna die anyways. There's no no faith there that God has made us for a reason, and that mm -hmm. there's there's there is a point. Like he's lost his his faith in who God is. That's what I said. That's what I <laughs> Definitely. So. When I, so when I, so as believers, so we live in the, the New Testament era where, we, where the sun has came, he's risen. When I hear this, I see a man that's been blinded to God's plan. That, hey, you didn't, God actually had a plan that extended through death, into yeah. resurrection, into new life, into, into eternal life with him. And for some reason, this man is blind to that. And I think that's what he lost. I think he lost connection to God, intimacy with God, and it blinded him to the fact that God actually has a plan. And so all these seizures were right in front of him. And that's just that I'm going to die. Like, he's been robbed of the good news. Yeah. So, he's getting more serious. Boss ball, has stolen more now. So he's stolen purpose. And he's stolen Sorry. knowledge of God. So he's a plan. He's stolen him. Say? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. He's misguided them, like you said. He's misdirected them. And so now he can't even see God's plan. All right, so now, two things. Purpose, misguided. Now, the third thing. So what we're, so what we're doing... Is we're investigating the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're we're looking at the the idol Baal, and we're saying that you have you ever read Ecclesiastes before? No, I haven't. It's a, it's about a guy who's just mad at the world. He's like life life stinks, and then you die. And so what we're saying is that Baal is the reason he's so mad, and that Baal stole something from him. So we've identified that Baal stole purpose. And what was the second thing we identified that Baal stole? stole? His faith, his identity. His faith, identity. What did you say, Priscilla? His vision. His vision. vision. His link to God's plan. Yeah. All right. So this is the third thing that Paul stole. And the final thing. It's from Ecclesiastes four one. All right. I'll read it and we'll engage. What translation are you reading? Uh, I am reading the New International Reader's Version. Okay. All right. Here's part. Do you want to read it? Four one. I gotta find the new international. Oh, you gotta read that. Version, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is four one. I looked and I saw how much people were suffering on this earth. I saw the tears of those who were suffering, and they don't have anyone to comfort them. Power is on the side of those who beat them down. Those who are suffering don't have anyone to comfort them. All right. So then again, he's, he's, he's talking about something that was stolen from him. So what do you guys what do you guys hear is being stolen in this situation? What do you think was stolen? 
And there's the people suffering and there's no comforter. It's just relationship. Relationship between people? Like between community? people. Okay. Yeah, you have to be very isolated to have nobody to comfort you. Okay. Most people call someone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, man? Well, one thing, one thing that he's saying here is that he says, So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are underneath the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. No comforter. Yeah. There, there was, there was, there was no comforter. They, they had no, no, nothing that they can turn to to find counsel or sanctuary in, mm -hmm. and that the oppressor was able to um, to oppress them, and there was no relief. Mm -hmm. There was no relief whatsoever, and that the, the that the oppressor was oppressing so much that I don't know what to do. I. I don't know what to do. I, I feel like I'm being squished. And that it would have been better if I had not been born. Well, actually, well, he didn't say that right. Well, I read it clearly. He does say that somewhere. He does say that somewhere else. He does <laughs> yeah. That. You know, that it would have been better. You know, that a person who, who was born and then died right out of the womb had a better life. Yeah. You know? But this, this guy, just, you know, the oppressor. Is oppressing him so much that he has no relief whatsoever. He doesn't know how to get in contact with God. Right. I agree. Anybody see anything else? How about that word comfort? I that comes up in the New Testament. You might know what it references in the New Testament? The Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. It references the, the presence of God with us, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes that like when I read this, like we speak about like the suffering and this injustice and this oppression. It seems like they've been robbed of the presence of God, you know, the presence that brings shalom, the presence that brings peace, the presence that, the presence that brings transformation and healing, that this isn't, that he doesn't see this operating. Somehow, somehow some way he's been disconnected from it. It's not in my life, it's not in the life of my community. It's, it's, it's gone. It's, we've been robbed of it. But he had it. He did have he, it. He had it in the beginning. He did have it. When he started out, he had it. Even how he says, power is on the side of those who beat them down. Yeah. Well, the people that have the power don't have to beat down the people that are working for and with them, number one. And number two, mm -hmm. he has all of the power because he's super wealthy. So he's almost talking about himself and how he's treating other people. Yeah, well, yeah that's how he ended up doing other people. Yeah, he exploiting that power he and that help. disconnect. Okay. He couldn't help himself. He's the oppressor saying, you know, they're suffering, you don't have anyone to comfort them. Okay. He's, yeah. Sorry. I get you, I'm this, I'm this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Verbal processor. Yeah, I get you. All right. So, so what, are we, what are we saying there's stolen in this? So we have purpose was stolen, uh, link to God's plan was stolen, and what's the third thing? What are we gonna, what are we gonna commit to? What was, what's stolen? The comforter. The comforter. Presence of God. Okay. Okay. Well, can we go with that? You guys roll with that? Mm -hmm. All right. I would say relationship. And relationship. Okay. Relationship between God and with, and with one another. Between God and with one another, and His relationship even to His people. Okay. Okay. All right. So you identify who got who who Baal was working with, and so we go with Kardashian, Kanye West, and some other people. So who and we identified the three things that were stolen. Now let's put it all together and let's find out what did Baal do. And how did he do it? And so, it all comes together in, in Ecclesiastes 10, verses 20. Verse 20. And, I'll, and I'll read it right here. So I think we have some people here who already know who already know who already know who Ball was working with. So I'll let them answer that part. So this is who Ball was working with, and this is so we know what he stole, and this is how he did it. Uh, you know the answer? No, she knows. She knows the answer. All right. This is this is something. Don't call down curses on the king. Don't even think about doing it. Don't call down curses on rich people. Don't even do it in your bedroom. A bird might fly away and carry your words and report what you say. All right, so who's Baal working with? King Solomon. King Solomon and rich people. So you're working with, you're working with King Solomon, you're working with rich people. So does anybody have a question, why is this guy saying Baal is doing this? I have, yeah, we haven't come across Baal one time in this in this book so far. Does anybody have any questions? I was just going to ask that. If Baal is the little statue that you showed us, how oh. is the little statue doing all of this? What's the... 
really glad that you asked that. So you can come up here and actually help us out. All right, so oh. I, I need to volunteer for this portion. So <laughs> I wasn't volunteering. So what you guys? So we, so we talk about Baal. So Baal works with the king, and he works with the rich people, right? Now you gotta remember, three thousand year, years ago when this was written, they spoke in Hebrew, right? They spoke in Hebrew, and so when we read, we read in English and we hear it in English. What I want you guys to do is I want you guys to hear this how the Hebrews would have heard. So we're looking at this phrase. A bird might fly away, okay? A bird might fly away. Now, I want you to listen really closely to what it sounds like in Hebrew. Do you know? It's a very highlighted word. It's already kind of translated, right? So listen, listen closely. What does it sound like in Hebrew? Bael Hakanaf. I don't get it. Just say the first one again. Oh, Bael. Yeah. B-A-A-L. Ball. 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 Hey, ball. Good job. So this, so this one little phrase, a bird might fly away, that, that's not even, did that sound weird to people? Like, what kind of mythical bird flies away with people's words and thoughts? Actually, it's a title. You know, have you, have you anyone ever heard of Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha? I mean, have titles for God. This was a title for ball. It means the owner of the night with wings. This is a title. And so it links Baal with our kings and with, our, and with the rich people. So this is where Baal comes in. And so how, so how does Baal work? You have to think about what it's like to be a king. So you read, you read the Old Testament. You know, kings, they have, a, they have a temple, they have money, they have all these other things. They have all these things, right? But they also have to worry about their sons chopping their heads off because they want the crown. They also have to worry about people revolting against them because they don't like the way they're doing their king thing. They also have to worry about other nations coming in, invading their walls, killing their men, enslaving their women. They got a lot of stuff to worry about. And so this is where Baal comes in. Baal comes in and says, look, you know that there are things in your life that are beyond your control. So look, come to me, worship me, bring your people to worship me, and I will give you control over all these things so that you can keep your crown and then everything will always work out in your best interest the way you want to. And that's how Baal works. That's how, and at the end of the day, the king did it, Solomon did it, and Israel was led away from Yahweh. It lost their purpose, lost their identity, lost their connection to God's plan because they went into the system of Baal's control. And that's what Baal, so and that's what the Baal idol represents. The Baal idol represents the idol of control. Baal is the idol of control worship. So what Baal says is this. Baal comes to us and says, look, every day when you wake up, you're gonna face situations, circumstances, and events that are beyond your control. You don't know, you don't have no guarantee they're gonna work out in your favor, and you have no control over them. But if you come to me, I'll give you control over these circumstances so that you can always ensure that they work out in your favor and in your best interest. Right. It sounds pretty cool, but let's, look, let's listen to what Yahweh says. Let's listen, listen to what, what the real God says. The real God says, look, yes, you're going to wake up and face situations, circumstances, and events that are beyond your control. But when you come to me, I will send you assurance that I am in control, and that I am with you, and that I am working in your best interest. These are two different systems. One says, hey, seek control for yourself, and it separates us from God. The other says, let's allow God to be in control. Let's trust God, and let's see, the, and let's see where that leads us. So as we engage with that, what do, you, what, do you think, what do you think the difference is? You see any differences between those two messages? You would see, you, when you look at it from the perspective of which you just presented it, you see that operating right now today, especially mm. the, the ball or bail yeah. outlook. <clears throat> because he presents people, you know, about you being in control. You know, where, you know, now you can do subliminal messaging, you, you can do self-hypnosis, where you can bring yourself, yeah. where you're in control of yourself, so that you are, you are the creator of your own destiny. So that these circumstances and events and things that are happening in your life, you will be in control of them. Yeah. And that you will be the one who will determine what happens in your life day by day by day, regardless of what other people are doing. It'll be in your hands. Right. You know, where it does take you away from God. Because it puts you in the perspective and the mindset that you are the only God. That you are God. That you're 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 God, you know, and that it's all up to you. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I see that happening a lot. When you look at um, a lot of the entertainers, a, a lot of people that are higher up in life, and a lot of people that are successful as to the way the term, the world views success, that that has a great major play in it. Definitely, this whole, this whole filter, that you, this whole illusion of control that they present us, right? Yeah, because that's what exactly what it is. It's an enlightenment of an illusion. This whole kind of fail by all connection to raw, connected to chorus and all that, it reminded me of Beyonce and the Super Bowl halftime show she did and all the symbolism that was in there for these very gods and how then they do have the power and the money and the fame and the success and the perceived control, but they're also removed and isolated with no real relationships and all of the flip sides of living Solomon's life. <laughs> and many of them actually started out in the church. They actually started out with the relationship with God. Yeah. Or maybe not a relationship, but a knowledge of God, an understanding of who God is. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's so true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you get from that? Um, I get that um, King Solomon was the very first thing when he first took over the kingdom mm -hmm. um, he didn't pray for riches or anything like that he prayed for wisdom mm -hmm. and God freely gave it to him mm -hmm. and um, God told him the things that to do in order for him to keep the kingdom right. alive and because of the wives that he chose the uh -oh. wives yeah, I'm crossing yeah. into something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because of the wives he chose, he chose um, wife, uh, women that served other gods. And they influenced him. Yeah. Yeah. He allowed himself to be influenced because if he had stayed away from those women to start off with, <laughs> if, 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 right. Definitely. You know what I hear when I hear this? It's, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's actually kind of tempting, right? So say I get, say I get control of everything I want. I can have things happen the way I wanted to, when I wanted to, and always in my best interest. If I go, if I go with Baal, if I go with Yahweh, if I go with real God, He says, trust me. <laughs> he says, trust me. And so I, so I have to, I have to acknowledge. So I have to first, I have to trust His power that He actually does have power over my situation. And then, when things aren't working out the way I want them to work out, I have to trust his wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then, as time kind of progresses and things still don't work out the way I want to work out, I have to trust that, God, are you really a good guy? And so there's this snowball effect of this, of, this, of this reality of the fact that if I really want to trust God, I have to get to know God. I have to move into deeper levels of intimacy. I have to know his wisdom, his power, his character, his goodness. I have to truly know God and engage God in every facet that he makes available to us. Over here with Baal, like that snowball effect never happens because I'm always seeking control for myself. It's a different snowball effect, but I'm always trying to gain and keep control. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, so that's how I understand Baal robbing this, this, this. That's how Baal robbed Solomon. That's how he robbed the king of, of Israel. Is that he sent him to a snowball effect that said, "You guys can control everything," mm -hmm. and they miss the snowball effect that you guys can actually really get to know God. You can walk with God. You can live in intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It kind of makes me see that human wisdom isn't enough. If he was the wisest man and all of his deductive reasoning allowed him to make these choices, then um, our human wisdom isn't enough. We can't rely on our ability to figure things out, to make the plans and to do what we think is best. And so it gives more, more creed to trusting God when he's asking you to do something that doesn't make any sense, because he'll do that. And we want to say, you know, this doesn't make any sense. And we process it and we work everything out. Our plan makes more sense. But even then, to still go with God's plan. Mm -hmm. Because our wisdom, obviously, is going to lead us into despair. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you ended um, God's, God's description um, with that he, trusting him and he'll lead you to something that's uh, in your best like that is better for you yeah. that
that is not just better, but it's best for you. Right. For Baal, it was like, look, you can do this and you can do it all day. And there was no like guarantee that it would be good, that it would help, that you would just be rich and you would um, plan your day out. With God, it was like, no, you'll you'll get the best. Yeah, so. yeah. You can do what you, you you can do what you think you're good all day long. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Power money, sex. Yeah, exactly. So, Same. In, <laughs> so so in the book of so I, I say it. To, to bit off Casey, what Casey was saying, another another place that Baal is real popular is in the book of Judges, where it says the people followed their own way. They, they kept falling into Baal worship, just doing what they thought was right. So what does this look like actually in, what, is, what does this look like in today's world? So to me, control comes in many different forms. It comes in the form of bad relationships. It comes in forms of substances, habits, even religious systems. And so to, so to begin to identify those things as forms of idolatry, as forms of Baal worship, provoke us to do something about it. Just to, because at the end of the day, they're robbing us, our children, and our community of God's presence, our purpose, and knowledge of God's plan, without which we, we simply can't function. So what do you guys see control taking? What do you guys see control happening in our community lives? I know you, you mentioned it in terms of like, that's always grasping for control and like self hypnosis and just kind of this, this, this illusion that we can be in control. But where else, where else do you see it happening? In? Well, you, you see a lot of it happening with um, gangs. Gangs, okay. You see, you see a lot of it happening with, with gangs where, you know, if you come and you hang out with us or if you, you know, you, 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 you come in, um, then we'll, we're, we're, we'll be the ones that are in control. We'll control this area. Right. You know, we're able to be the ones that are, will take care of you. You know, um, you have like a lot of uh, control uh, with, with, within the family structure. You know, um, a, a lot of times in, you find in, in, broken, in broken relationships where yeah. people are, you know, they're vying for control. You know, now if they can't get control over themselves, they got to have control over something. A lot of times they take it out on their children or they'll take it out on their spouse. I think if you move up to more of a middle class, upper class mindset, it's control of your money. Mm -hmm. I'm in control of where I invest my money. I'm in control of my savings so that nothing can phase me. No emergency. I've got something socked away for that. I'm in control for my insurance. So I put insurance on my car in case that's injured. Insurance on my house in case nature acts. I've got insurance over my body in case I die. I've got my health insurance. Mm -hmm. I have control over every possible acts of God or a situation that could come at me, I have now a plan for that and I have control so that I can make sure that those consequences don't hit me. So we do it with our money. I control my future, I control security. I won't ever be bankrupt, I won't ever have to worry about it because I have control for that factor with the money that I'm making. That's what form of idolatry it resembles Baal worship. Anybody else see? And you know, even though <clears throat> you would say that that's, that could be a form of idolatry, but yet and still, we're supposed to be in a position mm -hmm. to where we are at that point or level, but yet and still maintain a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And it's just about the balance. It, 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 what, so essentially, if we, we, as we move away from God, we're giving our time, our energy, and our efforts to something else. And so, if we can acquire these things and sustain these things at the expense of spending less time with God, he says, then maybe we should be maybe we should re examine how how important these things really are. So it's, it's, we gotta weigh the cost type thing. So I think that when it gets to a point in time where it interferes with our sense of intimacy, then we have to begin to step back and say, hey, you know Okay, but see now here when you when you say that when you say that and you make it look like that, then yeah. people yeah. who like say for example Steve Jobs, okay. Mm -hmm. Now he spent a lot of time focused yeah. on products, on ideas yeah. that produced great things. Yeah. You have people like say Thomas Edison mm -hmm. that spent a lot of times focused. You know, even though there was a question about his relationship with God, mm -hmm. you know, but yet still he was a brainiac. You know, you, you have people like Washington Carver. Mm -hmm. Okay, now this man, he would, 
he would take his Bible and a notebook and go lock himself up in a room and spend time with God. And because he spent time with God, God gave him God gave him stuff. And when he would come out, he come out with, with a notebook full of, full of ideas and stuff. He says, I got this from God. You know, so I, I think that there has to be a balance in how we spend our time in focus and how when we spend our time in focus in that relationship. Because it's just like the man that with the space shuttle. He's a Christian. And they needed a particular little um, module, uh, type of a computer chip. That, that he went in, he went into prayer. He spent a couple of days in prayer, just praying in the Holy Spirit. Right. That he got the idea yeah. on what was needed in order to make that thing go. Right, right. You know, so it's 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 a it's a fine line, I think. Yeah, I like what you're saying. Cause see, was, as I hear, I hear your story, you're talking about people who who approach things in a way where they integrate God, where they, where they embrace God, where they create space for God. So we talk about so we're not talking about people who are actually producing things. We're talking about people who actually just say. I don't need God. I can figure this out on my own. There, there is no integration. There is no space for God. And so, as we integrate things for God, that's not, that's not idolatry. And I think God wants us to do that. I think God gave yeah. us creativity and interest. Yeah. He says, exactly. when we get to a point in time where we say, I don't need God. I got this on my own. He says, then we're falling into systems that, of, of control and idolatry that are, are ruining our sense of intimacy with God. So, I, I agree. I, see, I like the integration, how we integrate things. Because the same guy that wrote Ecclesiastes wrote the Proverbs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, it's almost a contrast, mm -hmm. you know, that the same person wrote each book because he'll tell you in, in Proverbs, you know, in everything you do, mm -hmm. you know, acknowledge God first. Yeah, definitely. You know, acknowledge him and you keep him, you keep acknowledging him and he will direct your path. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you look around later and then he writes Ecclesiastics and you're like, oh, wow, what happened? He didn't take his own advice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. But you see that type of worship with the YOLO generation. What's How that YOLO, YOLO generation, you only live you once. Only once. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How they're like, oh, well, today might be my last day, or you know what, I'm just going to party, I'm going to turn up, do what I want to do. Because they feel like they're in control, and they feel like that they're never going to grow old, so they don't have to live with the consequences of their choices today. Would you call that group? The YOLO. Old, call YOLO. YOLO. You only live once. YOLO. Never well, it's not a group. It's just a saying. So it's yeah. not like, oh, yeah, the yeah. group YOLO is <laughs> just out there. That's what people believe. What, yeah. about, what about in our personal lives? What about when we come to a situation that we say, we have to be in control of it. It has to be done by me, my way, in my time. That's I have the only to be, way to do I it. Have to be, I have to be in complete <laughs> control of it. <laughs> That's my song. Do you think that resembles the element of, of, of yeah. what we're talking about? That I, I have to be in control of this. It has to work out my way. Yeah, yeah. because you're not humbling yourself. You're not, you're not, um, you, you're, you're not giving it over to God. You are, you are, you're still ah. doing the same thing that Solomon did, pretty much. I think in a typical we don't we don't look at those things as forms of idolatry. He said, but in the Old Testament sense, they are. They are a form of idolatry. There's something that interferes with our relationship with God because we can't be interdependent or dependent upon God to the extent that we need to be because we're in control and I got this. And I think even when like little things come up in life, like how we approach them as far as trying to find a solution for it, uh -huh. like um I guess for an example, like if there was like a financial need or something and instead of praying about it and trusting God to make a way for that situation, people start plotting about how they're going to do something illegal to get it or, you know, I have to go. Um, even like I feel like over time um, when I was working, uh, I, it was open access for me to work overtime yeah. and so I would sometimes like in those situations oh something comes up or I want to take my um, I want us to go to Disneyland for an example or something oh let me just work a couple of extra hours let me skip church this day or you know just put in these extra hours instead of actually trusting God that was you know kind of a weird um, 
example, but that's all I can think of. But you know how we kind of put take matters in our own hands, and that becomes you know a form of control, like trying to gain that control. Like I can make this happen for myself instead of actually trusting God to be that provider for whatever the need is. Definitely. Yeah. That's real good. I had a buddy of mine who did the exact same thing. If he was here, I would, I would call him out. He's not here, so I'm not going to say his name. <laughs> but, he had, but God placed people in his life who could support him, who could, who could help him out through his rough times. He decided, I'm too proud. I'm not going to ask anybody for help. So he goes out and he robs a store. Mm -hmm. He's three years in prison. Only because he didn't, only because he was too proud to ask. Too proud to ask the, the very same people that God put in his life for that reason. And I think when we do that, and we put all of that faith in ourselves and in our own ability, mm -hmm. we don't even realize that we're worshiping the God of control. Mm -hmm. You know, and we run up against our own limitations and then kill ourselves. There's still only 24 hours in the day. So no matter what you're capable of doing, there's still only 24 hours in the day. And you still have to sleep. And even if you're willing to sacrifice sleep, you can only pull so many all-nighters before you have to sleep. You know, you still have to stop and go to the restroom. I mean, there's still these human limitations, even when you're worshiping at the altar of your own ability, which is the altar of Baal, I can see, the altar of control. Definitely. So the, the goal of this study was to begin to see idolatry in a more practical way. So we often hear Baal, and it's like, oh, Baal, he's, he's Zeus. And you guys know, if anybody asks you Zeus in the Bible, you say yes, Baal. But it's, it's meant for us to identify how we live our lives as a form of idolatry. That, that certain levels of mechanisms that we give control over our lives or certain things that we try to control is a, is a form of idolatry. And it requires for us to repent and to surrender to God and to ask for renewal and, re and refreshing so that God can guide us down channels that lead us toward dependence and trust in Him. What do you think? Any, you guys have any questions? Oftentimes when I do studies, I don't know if I like give too much information, too little information, or if I if I found the balance. So if you guys have any questions over all over anything over Ecclesiastes, anything, you can uh, bounce them off of me, and I'll try to clarify where I'm points that I didn't make very clear. Oh, I kind of came in a little bit late, but if okay. you could explain. I mean, I kind of caught on, but um, like what you said in the beginning, um, like kind of explain this God of control like a little bit more. Baal. Baal? You want to know yeah. like his actual like, who he is, his characteristics type thing? Or? Yeah, okay. kind of, yeah. Okay. So Baal is the God of the sky. He's associated with like thunder, lightning, rain. Uh, his name means owner or lord. And he, he what's it called? The most popular passage of Baal, it comes in the book, have you heard the, you read the story of Elijah, who comes down fire from heaven? All right, so the story of Elijah is probably, is probably the most popular story of Baal. And so we're talking about control. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you asked this. What was happening in the book of Elijah? It wasn't raining. There was a drought. And so the children of Israel turned away from God and went to Baal so they can get control over the weather, over rain, over their crops. And, and so God, seeing that they went away from him, he rose up the prophet Elijah. And he sent Elijah earlier to confront the prophets. He sent out fire from heaven, had this really big contest. He, and Elijah beats the, beats the prophets of Baal, and he guides them back into Yahweh. And so that's what we talked about at the beginning. We talked a little bit about Baal. So he's actually, you heard, have you heard of Zeus? He's actually Zeus. And he's this god of control of the sky. And so in that one part that Janelle wrote where it says the owner of the, of the wings, that's, that's, what, that's, what, that's, what, that's what, literally what his name means, it's the owner of the sky. So I didn't get, I didn't get too much depth in it. I'll okay. be talking more about how he operates as opposed to who he is. So is, a, a, is procrastination a form of uh, control worship? you got to ask that to the next person who does an idol. I don't know. I don't, no. <laughs> I don't think. Procrastination and control? No, like, because... Yeah, 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 it's, it's, it's if, the same Because yeah, if you procrastinate, you're basically saying, oh, I got this. I can wait till the last minute. I'm in control. I can do it. And then... Yeah, I, I think it, I think it, in realms of, of arrogance, I think that it is. Essentially, yeah. like when somebody when somebody gives you a job, they say you have this much time to do the job, and they're assuming that this is how, this is how long it's gonna take you to do the job. When you say, ah, you're wrong. I know how to I can do the job in 20 minutes before you ask me before you actually want it. There's 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 a bit of arrogance in that. Mm -hmm. like, 
I know better than you know, Chinese. Alright. So I would say. Yes. Okay. So you are, you should work on that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Conviction. What, what is a person? Not every situation. Not every situation. You might know that. Like, I, 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 like, I could get like, yeah, like, that. Like, 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 I fix computers. Somebody might, like, hey, can you, can you have this done in a week? And I know it only takes me 10 minutes to, to run it. Though, and that's yeah, you know, I, I know that. But right. in general, like when I get a kid in the studio, hey, I want you to mix this track. I, I give you the instructions. I know your skill set. I know about how long it's going to take you to do this. And you decide to come at me and do it an hour before. I can tell by this trash that you gave me that you didn't do it when I told you to start doing it. And so that's and so it's, it's that kind of that kind of. Thing. <laughs> but definitely, it's not, it's not. It's not a. It's exclusive. It's not. It's not. Not every situation. <laughs> It, in, it's not but possible. it can be. It can be a form. In, in Casey's case, it is. But it is. <laughs>